mind. I'm going to do a meditation session in the beginning. I'm not online, right? Okay, it's seven o'clock. Let's get started. Thank you all for coming here tonight. I want to start with a small prayer. So I want all of you here and online just to get settled in your seat. Close your eyes and just take a couple of deep breaths. Just inhale through your nose. Deep inhale and exhale out through the mouth. One more time. Inhale through the nose. Exhale out through the mouth. And just quieten ourselves. Regular breathing and just feel Your breath. Each inhale and exhale, feel that. And feel the presence of the Lord as we silence ourselves. We are coming, you know, driving down in this traffic on, in Fort Mill. If you are at home, you are getting dinner ready. So just quieten yourself so that we can come in the presence of the Lord and let's open our mind and heart to hear this presentation. Hope you all are settled. So thank you again for coming and those of you online, thank you for joining us. We are so delighted to have Dr. Catherine Wright with us today. This is the third time she is here. We are a privileged uh, church. So Dr. Wright is an interdisciplinarian Christian eco-theologian working at Wingate University in North Carolina in the Religion and Philosophy Department. She has helped to create a new institute on campus grounded in the principle of sustainable development called the Collaborative for the Common Good and was chosen to be its first executive director on August 1, 2020. In 2022, Dr. Wright was honored with being named one of North Carolina's top 50 women leaders. Yes. Dr. Wright has also taught a diverse array of well-received courses such as Food and Faith, Global Perspectives on Ethics, Systematic Theology, Religion and Science, Theological Responses to Our Ecological Crisis, Suffering and Joy, Christian missions in the 21st century and eco-justice, in addition to many immersive travel-based trips to Asheville, Jackson, Mississippi, Ireland, Carolina Beach. As with her text, Dr. Wright invites students and readers and us to discover new ways of thinking and new behaviors with interactive and community-engaged exercises aimed to change hearts and heads while hands are doing the work of community transformation. We are in a treat this evening as she presents her field of study here, Food and Faith. And without much ado, Dr. Wright, thank you so much for coming here. It's such a privilege to be here. 
And I do believe you've taken a few of my pieces of paper with you, Sabina. I think you took a, a few, just page number one. So, um, but it's been an honor to come a few times to be here. Um, oh, no worries at all. And today coming for Earth Day, or Earth Week, Earth Exploration, it's a moment in time to remember the delight God took in the creation of the cosmos, as expressed in Genesis. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So this Earth Day, this Earth season, this moment in time, I want to take time for us to take great delight in good food and exploring the centrality of food in our Christian life, from dirt to dessert. And I want Paul to be our guide. Paul said to the community of Corinth, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. So how does your fork, your food, your food practices glorify God? We often forget that the story of salvation in scripture and beautifully depicted in this sacred space involved food and eating practices. Bread and yeast and wine, figs, fish, barley, wheat, wedding feasts, hungry people, banquets, exclusion, table fellowship. So tonight we will focus on how we can come to glorify God, care for creation, and create a space for the divine banquet around the many tables of our lives. There we are. It's woken up now. So there's three topics we're going to digest together. And yes, I have lots of food puns along the way. God the gardener, who has bestowed grace from dirt to dessert. Jesus the incarnation, and his ministry of touch and table fellowship. And hospitality as justice, a pathway to the divine banquet around the many tables of our lives. So each of these will be connected to the broken state of our food systems today, as well as faithful practices such as eating locally and seasonally, diminishing food waste, advocating for farm worker wages and protections, creating ministries that have good, nutrient-dense foods affordable and accessible to the community, and eating to promote holiness, wholeness, happiness, and health. So as we begin our exploration, I do want to start with prayer. God the gardener. And this prayer came from Eating Faithfully, an online program full of resources that I encourage you to explore in your spiritual and culinary journeys. So let us pray. Creator God, you made us and all that is calling creation good. Teach us again the nature of goodness. Cultivate this fruit of the Spirit in our lives so that we may reflect your goodness and justice in the world. God of abundance, open our eyes that we might see your gifts in the fruits of the ground and the beloved ones around our tables. Let our plates be pleasing to you. Our meals speak of your generosity as our creator, and our days be filled with pleasure and joy in food and community that reflects your heart. Amen. So the authors and first listeners sacred scripture, were agrarian who had an intimate and very visceral understanding that the health of the land, bodies, and souls were intertwined. They were not siloed or separate from one another, and this is why the very first story offered in sacred scripture is one where God creates everything, takes time to delight in everything, offers a vision of heaven as a garden, and declares that it was indeed all very good. Then the psalmists sing poetically of God the gardener who tends the earth, in Psalm 65. And those who are planted in the house of the Lord flourish, giving fruit throughout their lives and bearing witness 
to the goodness of God. That's Psalm 128. Faithfulness to God springs from the soil like plants thanks to the overflowing goodness of God. That's Psalm 85. So the writers of the Psalms and their first listeners understood the nuances to this wisdom that our modern imaginations really don't understand. They believe in God, the eternal gardener who created and tended a beautiful, creative, and cruciform world that is both interconnected and interdependent. They had no grocery stores with sterilized, dissected, kind of packaged meats or rows upon rows of cereal boxes. But the gifts they did have, one that came at great cost, was an intimate understanding that the meals that sustained their bodies, their lives, required the sacrifice and the death of another. Thus, when Joel speaks to how God restores the health of the land, animals, and people together, they comprehended this in ways that we don't. Now, I want you to tuck that away. We're going to pull that gem out in just a little bit. So the garden was the first context for God's interaction with humanity and God's plan for us to cooperate with God in the garden to bring forth beauty and love and peace and food. We were created as part of a finite world that feeds and is fed. This gift reflects the beauty and cruciform of our finite yet very good world. So the garden was a place of wonder and joy, of blissful interconnectivity. Everything was related since we share the origin story, this origin story. All were created and tended by God, and all is very good. God was the ultimate good and the source of our planet, goodness. So eating is a way that we participate in this goodness. As Tim Schrieff writes for the Catholic Rural Life magazine, we come to know God's goodness in the language of the plants and the animals and the stars and kernels on an ear of corn. And there's a concept that Dr. Norman Wurzba from Duke University, he writes about the theology of eating. This changed the way I saw a lot of things. He said, food is God's love made delicious. So food is God's love language. But is it ours? Is our Christian and Catholic identity shaped and informed by God the gardener and gifter of a world that is so amazing that it created strawberries? So bring in your imagination, since this is strawberry season in North Carolina, my apologies to those farther away that are not quite in the throes of strawberry season. What, if you bring into your imagination, what does that first bite of that beautiful, bursting, sweet strawberry taste like? Can you almost taste God's delight in that strawberry? Our creation story in Genesis tells us for five days, God labored, bringing forth all that is. And then on day six, shared this with us, gifting us with a special place and role in this unfolding, this ancient, this dynamic and delicious world. And then God rested. Now, God the gardener didn't grab his cell phone and try to figure out what the giraffes were doing and posting. Resting for God meant looking surveying, looking at everything that was created, and delighting in it. So think of a time when you planted something. Did you not delight at your accomplishments, watching in eager anticipation, anxious to see if what you've planted will grow? Remember a famous kind of a family dish that you absolutely love and you wanted to recreate in your kitchen with your family. Did you not delight when those savory smells and taste brought a flood of emotion and embodied memories from another time into your current moment. That is the power, the provocative power of food. So can you almost see God's delight whispering, my, these strawberries are divine. So God's delight in creation means that God does not just love creation as an object, but as Thomas Berry indicated, as a communion of subjects who materially manifest God's love. So an apple is God's love made visible, delicious, and nutritious. 
digging in the dirt, the sounds of the birds, earthworms wriggling and sharing stories around the table, fresh vegetables piled high with a little bit of that dirt on it after you pulled it out of your garden, the decaying matter of table scraps in the compost. What about that first peach, that first strawberry, those juices in your mouth? Don't they delight us? And all of these are an invitation into relationship with our planetary neighbors, the soil, the water, plants, and God. The story of Adam and Eve is one where people took was what was prohibited rather than the food that was gifted, and thus forever altering their relationship with God and each other and the creation they were a part of. Tasting the fruit of the tree of knowledge was not seen as a gift to glorify God, but an object to fulfill a desire to be God-like. I think we can learn a lot from this story. Our understanding of who God is, who we are, our relationship with God and our neighbors is diminished when the soil and the fruits of the soil are not seen as gift, are not seen as beloved gifts offered by the creator, the gardener. Now, I love the Irish poet John O'Donohue and the way he brings to life the Celtic imagination, especially how they believe that landscape is alive, something so different than our Enlightenment thinking that sees that which is not us as objects like superfluous around us. He once stated, so I have this beautiful little video of him talking, and he once stated that it really makes a difference in your life if you believe that you're walking through dead space or if you believe that you're walking into a living, sacred universe. He said if you believe the second, then your walk, and I say how you wield your fork, becomes very different. So to live faithfully means to remember that we are in an inspirited body in a specific time and place connected to a host of other bodies. We are made in the image and likeness of God, the gardener. But remember, we are both gardener and garden. We are stardust. And on Ash Wednesday, we are reminded of this. You are dust, and unto dust you shall return. Norman Wurzba, at a talk that he recently gave, he reminded me that we are host to so many microorganisms and bacteria who we need to exist, and vice versa. So most of us, most of this, is not us. We are a zoo, he said. I would say we're a communion of subjects, even our very being. So I can never be a solitary, singular being, but I'm a cacophony of beings that are co-becoming together. Doesn't that sound like a garden? Our well-being intertwines with the rest of our interior and exterior neighbors. And this is a fact we like to ignore. We also live in a world that depends on death. The magnificent creativity of our evolving world comes at a great cost. We are immersed in this world. We're not separate from it. And this cadence of reciprocity, giving and receiving, feeding and being fed, we are reminded every day through our eating. Our hunger pains remind us we are creatures that need. We are vulnerable. And Norman reminded me that your belly buttons is the evidence. So before you were born, you needed the sustenance of another to even exist. And as a mother, I know the, the very wonderful experience of actually becoming food for another person. We reflect so little on, little on the significance of eating. It is a profound, intimate moment of vulnerability and an invitation to join in the reciprocity animating the world that we're a part of. So perhaps you do remember this truth while celebrating Holy Communion on Sunday, but the meaning of vulnerability and reciprocity has been lost in our daily, ordinary, dietary lives. There's a few reasons for this. I would say it's fairly intentional. So after the 1950s, North Americans were increasingly told that they were consumers. That was our identity. Individuals who were primarily someone who purchases goods and services for personal use. So billboard after billboard and commercial after commercial 
We were told that purchasing is not just what you did, it actually is who you are. Males were told that they were the producers or the breadwinners, inferring that if they didn't compete well in this system that was constructed, they would be the bread losers. Women were designed as the food laborers and were sold a host of items in order to make this less of a chore. Now, there's a lot in between, but if you fast forward to today, we have all the food at our fingertips, on our phone, on an app, that comes almost to your door, and I think in the near future, almost right into your fridge. But in our frantic, busy world, easy, fast, and convenient are what we value. And food practices are seen as chores, a necessary evil to get done quickly or offload on someone else. We have no time to engage with food realities, nor the personalities on our plates. Nor do we think it's important for our spiritual lives. We don't relate to food in the created world as God, the gardener, invited us to. Our relationship with food in the created world has become transactional, and not relational. Our relationship with food is done by force and coercion, exclusion and violence. So our food systems have expanded on the backs of enslaved people, laboring on plantations and laboring under policies and conditions that have discriminated against them. Black producers are numbered in the 1920s around a million, and now there's less than 46,000. According to the USDA in 2017, out of the country's 3.4 million farmers, just over 1% are black farmers, and they own a mere half a percentage of America's farm line, despite being 20% of our population. Strikingly, 95% of US farmers, about 3.2 million, are white, while constituting over 60%, 64% of our total population. There's also considerable evidence that food workers and producers are invisible and not valued in our food systems. If we paid them livable wages, paid for child labor, offered them standard employment benefits like health care and occupational health and safety, then our food costs would rise by 100 billion. This does not even count the secondary impacts like mental health costs to farmers and fishers and farm workers or issues related to educational access. We do not pay the actual cost for what we eat. And the Green Revolution allowed us to greatly increase our caloric production. But with its violence and coercive practices, it came at a grave cost. Pollution from pesticides and synthetic chemical fertilizers it's hurting our water sources, our pollinators, our bacteria, our farm workers. Earth's biodiversity is diminishing, our soil is eroding away and becoming infertile, and farmers are struggling and often committing suicide due to enormous debt loads. What about the animals? Well, more than 10 billion farm animals are killed each year in the U.S. for consumption. And in global rankings, the U.S. ranked really low for farm animal welfare. This is due in part to the rise of CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations. So after World War II, in the 20 years after that war, livestock production shifted away from small-scale farms to industrialized CAFOs because of consumer demand, chicken, pork, and beef. The United States Department of Agriculture defines a CAFO as a feeding operation where there's at least 2,500 hogs, or 125,000 chickens being held in one CAFO. Carolina, North Carolina is now the second large hog producer or swine producer and the third largest poultry producer in the nation. There are over 7,352 7, CAFOs and over 156 of them. So that, if you do the math, about 39,000 hogs or 19 million chickens are in or beside a floodplain. So imagine the waste created by that many organisms in one place, and then a flood. Imagine also the smell of living beside these, the health issues that come from aerated animal waste, the pollution in local waterways and soils. Almost all CAFOs 
are in low-income minority communities. Imagine if they put one in Weddington. Imagine the uproar. That's not where capos are. So I believe we have forgotten who and whose we are. So our reality that God the gardener has gifted us with a world that tastes delightful and our daily eating reminds us that we are beings who feed and are fed. We need life with others. So as Christians and Catholics, we are called to be gardeners and garden, both givers and receivers of abundant life. And this is how our forks can glorify God. So when we believe we're both gardener and garden, not just consumers, our eyes will be open, like Cleopas, when he broke bread with a stranger he met on the road to Emmaus. And when these scales fall from our eyes, we will become amazed once more at the flavors, shapes, and textures of our world, and eat, pardon the expression, like we give a damn for God's sake. If we can't savor food, how do we savor each other? Or the land? Or God. So eating is our most intimate joining of the many bodies of creation and must be the primary site and means through which our reconciliation with God, neighbor, and earth will become visible, something we do every day. So remember I said tuck Joel away, the wisdom of Joel? Reconciliation means that we heal that which is fractured in our community. So our physical, social, and spiritual health is predicated on the health of the soil, on the child farm workers, on microbes, farmers of color, pollinators, cashiers, chickens, and watersheds. When any of these suffer, the whole body suffers. This wisdom our God, the gardener, has bequeathed us. So addressing global and local food challenges fork by fork is how we glorify God. So how do we do this? I'm, I'm, an active, practical theologian. Let's get to how do we do this. Be more thoughtful about the food on your plates as part of the story of salvation and wholeness gifted by God the gardener. Think, who is giving so you can be fed? What personalities are on your plates? What were their lives like? Who grew, harvested, prepared, and distributed the food that's on your fork? Who are you sitting at table with? Our ability to answer these questions demonstrate whether or not we appreciate God's redemptive and salvific work in the world. You could also be aware of the words that we use to talk about the food system and those that may not have access to food. So I always say avoid saying food deserts. Why? Because deserts are incredible biomes that are vibrant with life and resilience and creativity and goodness. Instead, talk about food apartheid. I know that's a much scarier word to use. It invokes a much more emotional, but there's a history to that. We grow and produce enough calories for everyone. That's a fact. It's the unjust distribution of food and social societal wastefulness that's the problem. We have constructed a food system that keeps certain people in our community hungry. So, learn the histories of structural sin, like what policies, biases, and legislative legislation prevents the financial security of some people, like home ownership or land ownership. Who is denied access to grocery stores or culturally relevant food or nutritionally rich food? Ask yourself, would Jesus enjoy what we offer in our pantries every day? Ask yourself, are white individuals just better at farming? And that's why most of them are farmers. I would say answers to both of those are no. We have to ask these questions. Also, practice the art of neighboring. When planning your meals and dinners and socials and communion, talks, lectures? What can you do to provide, to protect, to promote the well-being of the other? You can also develop prayers and sermons that reflect our call to become close to the land and farming and food as a way of becoming close to God. Invest in sustainable grassroots solutions so you help community members grow their own food, elevate their voice, share their knowledge with others. 
Support communities who are working to transform our food system. Commit to community food projects and ministries like the Black Church Food Security Network. They build food security, resilience, and food sovereignty. Or maybe take some Jewish synagogues in New York as a model. They be have become sites for CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. Personally, I love the food justice work that goes on in this parish, grounded in Catholic social teaching. I love it. I'd love to talk about that more if you want to talk after in our Q&A session. You could also respect the natural order of God's creation by not using pesticides and synthetic chemical sprays or maybe even fertilizers that are synthetic. Find other ways to promote green church lawns or plant gardens instead. Now, Alexandra Greenlee, a farmer writing with the Catholic World Life magazine, indicates that on her farm, they accept that every year 10% at least goes back to God through his creatures. We take care of the environment because it belongs to God. We are stewards, so spraying chemical sprays affects the food, the water, and the people's health. They don't do it. You could practice more self-discipline. This one's tough. Sync your food shopping with creation's natural rhythms and buy seasonally. Be creative with what you can get, perhaps over the winter. And don't be afraid to consistently learn. Always learn. And also, try and understand the costs of food, such as industrial produced meats or processed foods. Many of the costs of these foods are externalized to the most vulnerable. So changing our diets and how we shop can has really positive impact on animal welfare and the climate. Consumer demands shape the market. Every dollar is a moral value statement. So there are many options that require small investments, but reap big rewards. So imagine if the over 200 million Christians chose these paths to glorify God and love their many different neighbors. Wouldn't that be some really good news? But Jesus in the incarnation is where I want to move next. And again, I want to start with prayer because I think centering ourselves in Jesus the incarnation is so important. So incarnate God, you who became flesh to dwell among us, teach us what it means to be bodies living in a particular place. Move us to sink our roots deep into the soil and the watershed in the lives around us. Form us into beloved places where bearing witness to your great love. Amen. Again, from Eating Faithfully, an online resource. So food is common ground a universal experience, and a spiritual encounter because food is a manifestation of God's love and Earth's ability to nourish. It's not insignificant that the first human was called Adam from Adama, meaning land or soil. Adam was created as inspirited soil to be the first gardener, caring for the garden, the soil that made up him. He cared for what was caring for him in return. He participated in this reciprocity and that glorified God. So it's not surprising then Christ, the second Adam, was actually mistaken for a gardener by his own mother at the very first Easter morning. So this vocation of gardener, giving and being given, serving and keeping the garden, is what we've been bequeathed in our baptism. And it's our participation in the body of Christ that is church. Now a bold statement was also by Tim Shreef, who I mentioned before. He said, ignorance of agriculture and rural life is ignorance of scripture. And ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. I believe he's talking about having a more incarnational theology of eating. That is vital for Catholics who participate in the church. So the earliest councils affirmed a very central belief that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Today we understand Jesus became incarnate. He emerged from Earth's creative impetus as a homo sapien. He was an embodied, fleshy human. This fact is sometimes feared because it is wrongly thought to diminish the godliness of God. However, could we not understand it as a bold choice, a bold affirmation of the goodness of creation? Jesus, the incarnation, as a unique way God chose to delight 
in creation. So if we see Jesus in this way, we will remember that much as Jesus' ministries took place in rural communities, he met people in open places, he prayed in nature, we will understand the importance of being a carpenter in Nazareth We will remember the good news of Jesus' birth was proclaimed to shepherds, the vocation again, to care for and be cared. His stories and parables were about mustard seeds and landowners and vineyards and grains of wheat and tending flock and leaving the land to rest. He called fishermen as his first disciples and tasked them with the good but really hard work of bringing the good news to others. And to Simon Peter, I read this when I'm really down. He gave him the greatest task of all. If you love me, feed my sheep. Dr. Ellen Davis, a professor of Bible and practical theology, she indicates that our call to discipleship, like Peter, may well be a call to remember our kinship with the fertile earth. Soil is more like a relative than a resource. It is to be respected and not used. So what if we reclaim our rootedness in creation, our identity of soulful soil, the practice of reciprocity? This is incarnational wisdom, a deep knowledge of our places, our food, and our eating practices that opens our eyes to the injustices that are fracturing our community. Jesus, the incarnation, models for us how to heal these fractures. Like Jesus, let us embrace our humanly nature, delighting in good food, prepared lovingly, and shared abundantly. Like Jesus, let us heal and feed bodies good food. Perhaps we can pay more attention to what we eat and the act of eating. Like Jesus, let us approach leaders in our church communities and ask how the community can expand the communion table beyond the walls of the church. Perhaps with great humility, our communities can awaken to our collective silence concerning food injustices. Perhaps, like Jesus, we can be the leaven that makes space for holy engagement of food issues in our church. And like Jesus, let us recognize who are marginalized in our community and invite them to the table. Jesus' ministry cared about bodies and touching that which is wounded to bring them healing. He created table fellowship where all were welcome as they were. And this healed community. We were all, we were given a chance to love and be loved. And in his ministry, everyone who came to the table got that same opportunity to feed and be fed. A dear friend of mine reminded me that after Jesus ate his way through the Gospels, And after he rose from the dead, he didn't return to the cross. He came to the table, a seaside breakfast with his disciples, a meal in the upper room where they were scared and they were hiding, at a table at a rest stop on the road to Emmaus. This is how Jesus glorified God and gave us all a taste of the heavenly banquet here on earth. So how do our ministries compare? So food and intentional eating practices is a material way to reinforce a different vision of wholeness and health than is offered in our fast food, convenient, industrialized food system. Delighting in our food system from true table fellowship and justice, that is our vocation. Every day when we eat faithfully, we are expanding the grace offered at the table of the Eucharist into ordinary and necessary moments in our own lives. We are participating in a long history that extends back centuries to the early church. We shared a meal in each other's home. This was how the early church was church. They sang together, they danced together, they recounted the good news of scripture, and all of these activities were part of the great story of love. They were telling about God's desire for all to enjoy abundant life, from dirt to dessert. Around the many tables of our lives, we are quite literally, literally being formed into the likeness of Jesus, who was given to sustain and nourish us, the bread of life, lamb of God. So good food is not just how it tastes or how it looks, but holds spiritual meaning. 
The goodness of food is connected with justice since God, who is good, seeks justice and well-being for all. So food and table fellowship are not superfluous. It's not secondary to the story of wholeness and reconciliation in the Gospels. It is central and vital to the good news. This good food must be produced and processed and distributed and disposed of in just ways. So I love this definition of food justice. I think it's really simple and yet hard and beautiful. All people have access to food that is fresh, healthy, affordable, and culturally appropriate. Just food means everyone in the food system and supply chain are compensated fairly and have safe working and living conditions. Just food is produced or tended or caught and eaten in sustainable ways that promote the flourishing of earth. What is good must promote health and well-being and wholeness for all. This is the promise of and the pathway to the divine heavenly banquet. The spiritual power of our forks is the ability to offer a taste of this divine banquet in the here and now around the many tables of our lives. But so many have not tasted this justice. Black and brown farmers are denied access to land and capital because of discriminatory practices that inhibit their well-being. They were discriminated in lending practices, higher interest rates, lower loans, longer time to process loans. These are discriminatory acts that prevent well-being. Farm workers and workers in meat processing factories who are primarily immigrants and people of color have been exploited through low wages. Did you know that in 2017, the USDA found that 30% of farm families live below the poverty level? Also, the, the farm workers, they suffer in inhumane housing conditions, the lack of legal protections, and unsafe working conditions. And during COVID, meat plant processing factory workers, they died at disproportionately higher rates. And the message was very clear. Americans wanted meat, and meat packaging workers had to risk their lives to provide it. Now, economic disparities in our community causes higher rates of food insecurity for people of color, especially children. The most vulnerable bodies are receiving the worst foods, and they pay a steep price. Obesity is 1.2 times more prevalent in black Americans than the national average. The rates of diagnosed diabetes are 1.7 times higher in Latinx Americans and 1.5 times higher in black Americans than white Americans. Black Americans and Native Americans also have the lowest life expectancy rates and the highest maternal and infant mortality rates out of all the demographics. Unaccounted for human, environmental, and economic costs for food are born and dis disproportionately impact communities of color. Animal welfare is at an all-time low in the U.S. with the numbers of CAFOs skyrocketing. You might have heard about the farm in Texas Machinery overheated and exploded. 18,000 cows were killed on that one, one place. These CAFOs are expanding because Americans want more and more chicken and swine and beef. And as a nation, it's interesting on the opposite end, we waste almost 40% of the edible food at a cost of almost 200 billion, I had to double check that, $218 billion a year. And this translates into about 238 pounds per person. And this ends up in landfill, creates methane, which is a greenhouse gas that is more potent than CO2, exacerbating climate change. So what does good food look like? That is not good food. We can act to offer a taste of the divine banquet when we offer and use and participate and produce good food. So understand food is a gift economy. It's not a transaction. It's not something you earn or reward. Eating is political, it's cultural, and it's a spiritual activity that beckons you to delight in food and people and reciprocate with humility and gratitude. Perhaps this good food 
that is a taste of the divine banquet would be purchasing eggs or goat soap from farmers who you know care about their wards like relatives. Perhaps it's using the purchasing power of your church or your family or, like myself, a higher ed institution to support local producers, sustainable vineyards, chefs, and others working to food justice in your community. Perhaps you reduce the amount of meat that you eat, sourcing what you do from smaller farms who you know has a holistic perspective, and I'm telling you, the meat will taste better. Financially support farmer-led best management practices aims at conservation. So I was telling you a little bit about CAFOs and beef CAFOs. In Chesapeake Bay, it hurts some of the organisms in Chesapeake Bay, the ecosystem, but the farmers themselves are leading the conservation efforts. So support them, doing the work of their vocation to be a farmer. Perhaps you want to become a local war. Support a local CSA. Create and support a church garden. Educate yourself and your family about the real prices. Help ensure that your local farmer's market is accessible to your less affluent neighbors. Make sure that SNAP and EBT and other accessible products and, and services are there so they can enjoy the farmer's market too. Realize when the food you are eating is disproportionately burdening others and change your he eating habits. So coffee and chocolate are often come to us through pain and suffering of other humans and the environment. Explore options. There are options. Perhaps, like some, and I, I know some of the parishes in this area, they have fair trade markets. Maybe host one at Christmas. Offer alternatives. Part of the ministry is education and advocacy. You could also recognize that your food ministries are charity models. Oops. I'm going to back up on that. Recognize when your models are charity models and not justice models. Charity models are not bad, but they assume that often problem is producing enough food. Or we serve very passive, anonymous recipients. And then we feel good because we then move away. A charity model is where you begin, but a justice model is where you want to end up. That's where the problem is understood as poverty and systemic inequality. So the responses are harder, long-term systemic changes that you can't leave behind when you're done your service. You can awaken to our identity as being beings who hunger, who feed and are fed. Every single one of you, online and here, you are planted in a unique space where you can feed others. So how are you doing this? I want to share a little bit about how I have been doing this. Not because it's the way, but it happens to happen in my sphere of influence, as, as an example. So what we did was we polled our students annually every year, and we added a food security question. So we asked the right question. And what happened was we found that over 33% of our students experienced food insecurity. I knew that working with a lot of our commuter students, first-gen students, Pell Grant students. These are who we're called to serve. So I listened. For a long time, I listened. Why are people hungry? And then we created some wonderful ways of creating a very justice-oriented program. We created paw provisions. Our, our mascot is a bulldog, so everything is dog-related. So paw provisions. We called it a free store, not a pantry. A free store where many of our students needs whether it's friendship or connection we have casserole days food and we even have donated clothing for for job interviews because we found that sometimes they had to choose so we opened in December we've opened 31 times we've served almost 600 students and we've received over tens of thousands in in-kind donations it is phenomenal we invest so that they can then we feed so then they can feed. We also started a free snack program on Wednesdays. We sit right in the middle of the quad, and they come up, and what I found was they often ask, what do I have to do to get this? Do I have to sign up for something? Do I have to volunteer? We're like, no. Come, you made it to Wednesday. We are grateful, and we delight that you are you. That was it. Come and get food. I tell you, they told us everything that was on their hearts, their minds. They come back every week. 
We partnered with two nonprofits, one a humanitarian, um, and in our community, we have, it is phenomenal. We have Cliff Bars and Gatorades, and we have all sorts of peanut things. We have all sorts of things that have come in. Almost $24,000 worth of free, in-kind donations. And the fun part is, our partners connected with distribution centers. And if you know the freshness date, that if they can't, if it's within a three-month window, they can't ship it out because it won't get to where it goes in time before the freshness date. I don't think Gatorade ever goes bad, but there's a freshness date on it. So what happened was they go to landfill. So this, and it's not us, it's Convoy of Hope. They go to the distribution centers and say, what's getting close to the freshness date? And they load transport trucks. And within a few days, they have it all over the nation. They're a humanitarian organization. And we got two transport trucks full of all sorts of wonderful things. And our kids love it. They're, they light up that someone cared about them and delighted in them enough that they realized that maybe a snack is what they needed to finish that paper to get them to graduation, which gets them to a different economic stability to invest in the future. So the next thing we did was we noticed that students of affluence wanted to buy good, nutritionally dense foods. So we created a farmer's market because we heard farmers saying, Saturday markets are great, but we need something during the week. We need another site for financial gain. So we created a farmer's market on our campus. And it is an opportunity, it's two hours a week for our community to bump into an, others and delight in each other's company. We've had 11 markets, we've had 1,600 people come through, we've had 33 different organizations offering services and goods, free sunscreen, all sorts of things. So the community and campus come together in this little market, and it's beautiful. And as you heard, I developed also a food and faith course so that it is an interactive, high-impact course that connects campus and community where we really understand food through many different religions, from dirt to dessert in so many different ways. That is how students learn about faith because they all eat, so they come in on an equal basis. So all our underserved students, our COVID kids that came in perhaps underserved, they all come in knowing that they all have this experience of food. And that's how we learn about Hinduism. And that's how we learn about Christianity. And that's how we learn about social media and how it impacts their bodies. It is the context for wholeness, holiness, and health around the many tables of their lives. We're creating an interactive book, and hopefully it will be published in the, in the fall. So if you want to talk about that, I can answer any of your questions. Um, but... It is so important around the many of the tables of our lives to understand this call and this connection between food and our spiritual lives. It's the pathway to the divine banquet, the heaven. So as just before we get to our, our kind of question and answer and, and interaction kind of place, I'd love to end with prayer. Again, center us with prayer. Hospitality is justice, the essence of divine banquet. Again, this is from eating together faithfully, but I've adapted it for us tonight. So generous God, because you give us yourself, we have all we need, from dirt to dessert. You multiply our bread and our fish and tell us to come follow you. You form us into communities of Jesus, the incarnate. And promise us we will never hunger and thirst. Yet we confess that we have squandered your gifts. We have failed to be good stewards of your bounty. While we indulge and waste, others go hungry. Teach us again your economy of enough. Feed us with your grace and spirit so that we may feast together with our neighbors, recreating even just a taste of the divine banquet in our midst, one table and one fork at a time. Amen. So we have lots of time to kind of interact. And I know it's hard in this place, and I know on live stream it might be even more challenging <laughs> to, to find a way of interacting. But 
I'd love to entertain any questions that people might have or go into more detail in any area. If there's something that you would love to hear more about, I'm all ears. I know it's quiet in the sanctuary. Yes. That is an excellent question. So the question was, how do we get at farmers markets more accessible to those who are less affluent? So the best ways to do it is to make sure that EBT and SNAP are being offered. To do that, I can, I can kind of walk you through. <laughs> Trust me, we have investigated many different avenues. Every farmer's market is a little bit different. So I know the one in Charlotte, close to my house, I went and talked with all the volunteers, great, great bunch of individuals. And their Department of Health has an account. So basically you need account with the government because most EBTs are a credit card. So you have to have the equipment to be able to slide so that the card is loaded with kind of like you have a certain amount of money and then you can use it. You come to the farmer's market and say you want $25 worth off your EBT card or your SNAP, your benefits. Then they give you tokens that are $25 worth. So then you can go around and, and it's like cash. And then at the end of the day, the farmers go back to the, the, the table and then they get credited with that. So they get a receipt and then the government pays them. So there ha there's a couple of logistics. So the financial component, you need accountability so kind of there has to be an organization. In Monroe, it is through the Ag Center. So one of the, um, the co-op, they have an account. And again, they get, you get audited at the end of the year, which is a, you know, just to make sure that the farmers got paid and, and it comes out of the government program to make sure everything accounts. Someone has to set up that account. So with the university, what we're trying to do, we're in the midst of doing it, is that we have to go through our financial office if we want to be able to do that. The good thing is I called 15 different people uh, all the way up the chain. You can get the equipment for free. So the equipment can be for free. A really fun thing is you can also get, there are grant programs out there that will double. Meaning if someone comes and says, I would like $20, they can have $40. So they would come and say, okay, if I want 20, I'll just get 10 off my snap and then I can get 20. So it's, it's a double down program. So there are lots of ways of doing it. And that, it's also done, I love the token because it's not, there's no stigma. You're using tokens, but it's not, it's done in such a way that everyone is included at the table. And that was why we didn't go with pantry, because to a lot of our students, that is, if you're not successful, you go to a pantry. It is seen as a handout, whereas a free store, they're bringing donations in of t-shirts or whatever, and we're partnered with many different nonprofits. So if we get too many t-shirts, they go off into the community. We're doing a don't dump donate. So at the end of the semester, if things don't fit in their parents' cars, often they go in the trash can because what are they gonna do with it? You literally have to be out in 24 hours. So we give them a very central location where it's easy to drop it off, toaster ovens, mini fridges, and then it goes to the, the community shelter when they're moving, families out and there's linens and all sorts of things. So we have three or four different avenues for that. Our free store will keep some of it for our incoming uh, students who might need it. So we're creating a way to divert from waste, but in a way that's very much student-centered. I didn't come up with the name. I am not that creative and I'm much older than the students. So we have three student marketing interns who develop the marketing program. So same with Farmer's Market, creating and having, allowing those who are using the system to have a say in how it looks will allow that, that allowing opportunities for people to feed and be fed, that reciprocity, there has to be a way to contribute. So on SNAP, you're contributing by this is how it could look like. So having an um, advisory board that has individuals of different affluence really important because then the messaging allows for everyone to be welcome. Is that helpful? I can, I can sit down and kind of tell you who to call too. I have that kind of detail. Um, but it is very important to know in different places it, it looks different. 
But if we don't do that, then what happens is the only the affluent have access to that really beautiful, the market, the, the, the shopping experience that says delight, the flowers, the, like all sorts of things. Um, and with SNAP, you also know that not everything is covered. So there's certain things that can and can't be, be purchased. Bread can be purchased, produce can be purchased, but often signage is hard. If you go and you don't know who you can shop from, it's really discouraging. So there's, I always say you have to have the technology, the, the how, but it has to be done in the right way. Um, and that takes listening, that it really does. It's a beautiful thing, and I love that you asked that question. Because often we don't offer beautiful shopping, beautiful food, because we don't believe that those who are less affluent are valuable enough for those experiences. We do, and sometimes it's an internal bias. Um, you know, and, and those are the things that I educate and, and try and work, work with people to kind of uncover a little bit. Because when it's beautiful and done right, it is beautiful and it empowers people. That's the justice model. Any last questions? Oh, I love it. This is a great crowd. And people online, I know it's live stream. Um, if there are questions that you would love to ask me, then the website that, that I developed for this, this of kind of interaction is the right W-R-I-G-H-T, ecotheologian, oh, it's on the screen, dot com. You can always send me a note and ask me kind of questions, and I will get back to you. It's lovely. It goes right to my email. And um, because I think this is important. These, these are daily practices that can glorify God, and I think it's really important because we're all byproducts of that, that sense of food is an object, food is fuel, um, and I think we're missing out a dimension of our spiritual life. Like, I'm looking around at, at all the, the stained glass windows, the amount of vegetation and figs and lunch and dinner, and, like, there's so many pictures, and we just don't see it when you think food is a commodity versus a gift. Um, and I think we will just add so much richness to our, our spiritual lives um, when, we, when we do. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is an excellent question. It depends where you live. I would say in this area, Waterkeeper Alliance, excellent for legislative for watersheds. Absolutely, they really excellent. Um, oh, okay, sorry. I'm, I can lean in and even be louder. Um, so there's Watershed Alliance for North Carolina. Now again, there's, there's others. Um, I find that the Farmers Market Coalition is really good. Um, another is RAFI, R-A-F-I, which is the Rural Foundation Advancement International. They do justice work with farmers, and if you go on their website, you will find all sorts of things. Legislative, so they just did a workshop on just policies, so you can understand and learn what a like to read through and understand just policies and advocate for them. So RAFI, I would say, is phenomenal. Yes, R-A-F-I. And if you Google it, it's Rural Advancement Foundation International because other RAFI things come up. There's a musical group called RAFI and there's all sorts of things. Um, Waterkeeper Alliance for uh, Watersheds, um, Chesapeake, so I would look locally too because in Chesapeake Bay, it's the, their alliance for water or working with farmers for best practices. 
And the farmers want to do this, so it's not like us against them. Like, and, and they often know what the best practices are, but if your farmland is right b beside, you know, kind of a watershed, what can you do? And often, it is small investments like tree lines, um, but again, if you're 30% 30 per, 30 or under the poverty level, you don't have investment to be able to do that. But 200 million Christians do. So that's the, the I always say the financial um, moral movement is that if we choose that this is important, 200 million Christians can make a lot of difference and find out a lot of things. My husband works in business and he always says, if you change what consumers want, I can give you more sustainable products. But right now, price is everything and convenience and fast. So if fast, convenient, pretty looking, I always say social media, pretty looking food is what people want, then a lot of the activities will, will channel towards that. So if we change what we want, if we change expectations, every dollar is a moral statement towards what kind of food. So if we think good food isn't necessarily easy, fast, convenient, but it's homegrown, it's local, it is seasonal, it is supporting local farmers, that changes everything because then the demand will be there and more investment in those practices will happen. So again, using market forces to, to change because consumers want fast, easy meat. So even the way chickens are produced, more breasts, like a different shape. So demand changes what the market can bear. So it, again, I always say go back to 200 million Christians. If we wanted something different, that's a lot of financial leverage. Um, and eating a little less and understanding the costs. And I always say there are viable options we just have to want them. And so part of my education, what I do on my website is to give access. So I will have this up with all my notes in it. I will have all the slides. So lots of ways of getting you in touch. So if there's a group, an organization, you're like, I would really love to know more about this, like Jewish synagogues and how they started the CSA. Great, I can do that. That's my, as an educator, that's, that's my ministry. This is my sphere of influence, so please don't be shy. Um, and I'm also giving a talk on dirt to dessert, so many of this, but really focused on composting and, and food waste. So if you want to know a little bit more, on May 6th, I'll be offering that in Charlotte. Um, but again, there's a Zoom option for all our online wonderful people. Um, and, and I would say prayer. If you notice, every prayer posted the content of what I was talking about. I embellished in, in what is actually happening, but every prayer constituted the content of what we're doing. So I would say don't underestimate prayer. And there are so many Catholic, Catholic rural life. You want to know what's happening in Catholic rural life? Their magazine, their website, fantastic. Never knew about it. Christian homesteaders, never knew. Like, so the more I research, the more I can talk, and, and the more I can connect people, um, with people who really, really reimagine what good food is and how bringing that taste of that divine banquet, everyone deserves that, that delight. So how can you do it in your sphere of influence? Love to help. And I, I showed you just some of the things. Those are four, four things, but it's changing. It's having impact on our campus. Kids are now going, hmm, oh, the cafeteria. I have to have a chat with them, but they're like, well, is this locally sourced? They're like, I have to talk to Dr. Wright. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. But it's, they're asking really good questions, and that's how you change systems. It's when they're invisible. Like, I didn't realize farm laborers have the least amount of protection. Least amount. So the protection, labor protection laws, everyone except agricultural laborers. How did that happen? How did we let that happen? Um, well, we need a lot of labor for our agriculture, and we don't want to change our eating habits. So there, there was this, this communal understanding that, except for them, um, 
not on my watch. Like, let's, let's bring it back to the forefront and go, why? Why is this, why is this okay? So let's uncover some of our, our value system. Who do we value more and why? Um, there's my ethics. That's my ethics lesson for today. So you guys all pass, all pass. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. that is it and and prisons as well so i know they're not the same but but access to good nutritionally rich food i would say there was one individual who i've been talking to so she's a chef and the head of the piedmont culinary guild chris reed phenomenal when i talked to her about um her first well her executive chef career like one of her first was at a, a retirement center and the message she gave to all the people working saying this food is for individuals who this might be their last meal and so they need to delight in the companionship they need to delight in how it looks they need to delight because that's how we show value that's how each individual person in the kitchen i don't think that's how most retirement homes or most senior nutrition programs are run um, and that's an area that I haven't worked as much in, but that and prisons. Because again, who we offer access to good, nutritionally rich food, culturally appropriate, so that's another issue, culturally appropriate food. So if you're changing your home setting and moving to, to a, a retirement home, is the food there reflective of who you are and your cultural identity? I'd have to do a little bit more research on that to find out. But I know the prison system, a lot to be desired, again, because if you're not seen as valuable, then the food reflects that. It's a manifestation of societal love. It's a manifestation, is it easy, is it fast? And I wish I could go into more detail. I'm working on um, part of the book that I'm, I'm writing looking at cultural messages that we give to different people and different bodies. Um, so dude food, uh, brogurt, uh, pathetic salad. So these are, these are catchphrases, but understanding that how, how you value an, or, an individual or their bodies, whether they're fully able or differently abled, how food is, is marketed and, and created and sustained. That, that, I'm in that chapter. So, what I want to do is to take a look at imprisoned bodies and also senior bodies and what kind of messages, what kind of food. Because often, now I don't have research for this, but I see a lot of commercials for, for nutritional supplement, fantastic. But I think there's ways to have good nutritionally relevant foods. And, and the more I look at restaurants that are having grandmother days where they come in and the grandmothers are cooking and all the oh my goodness and fiscally there are people are flocking to these restaurants so i'm going to do a little bit more work there but i'd love to find out your experience to see if that could guide um, my work but if we don't value the bodies we don't value the food that are offered and we also don't offer that reciprocity we don't we and some projects are are doing this but the idea of contributing back so everyone in the, the nursing home or different, you know, multi-capacity facility has something to offer. Do we, do we allow that? Do we build programs? Do we, do we do things, especially around food, to enable that? Food is so powerful that people with Alzheimer's and that, or, or dementia or different, different cognitive abilities can immediately smell something and be taken back to a certain memory in a certain time and know every detail. Music does the same thing, can take them to a different place where that cognitive clarity is there. I think that's important, and it's a powerful tool to build that community that we're, we're really desiring that heavenly banquet. Um, but that's the area I haven't gone into. That and, and prisons are kind of my next venture. Thank you. That was such a good question. Oh, I know. We're, we're over a little bit. Sorry. 
So thank you to everyone online. Sabina, do you want to say a few words? Kind of. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, you're welcome. So, first let me say thank you very much, Dr. Wright. Um, your talk was very inspirational. Um, in reading Pope Francis's writings on um, climate and care for our creation, I, I think that was the thing that struck me and inspired me was just the whole idea of appreciating what is around us and that our spirituality starts with that um, appreciation. And um, I'd like to say thank you very much for sharing that inspiration, not just your knowledge, but your vision um, has been super enriching um, today. So thank you very much. Um, and I recommend to anybody also who might be looking for a good book to read, um, the Richard Rohr's uh, book. Um, I just went blank on the name of it. Um, the Universal Christ is another book that really shares that whole vision of everything. Christ is in everything that are, is around us, and we need to sit and appreciate that to start our own mission. <clears throat> I will also share with you that we have been doing here a free trade, fair trade <laughs> event every Christmas um, and really talking about some of those, the issues with chocolate and coffee and where we get those products. Um, and we also are feeding meals to the men's shelter <clears throat> at least monthly, right? Twice a month, twice a month, and have been doing that for years, so it's a very big deal um, to, to take our beliefs and put them into action. So I'd like to invite everybody to um, share a closing prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our lives are held connected one to the other, and all are connected to God. All of creation is deeply interconnected and interdependent, reflecting the world as God made it to be. We as humans cannot exist without all of creation, air, water, earth, and sky. Plants and animals, all one beautiful woven fabric. Let us in solidarity with all of God's creation praise God from whom all blessings flow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.